Right. Uh, apologies for that, folks. Um, I have done a Zoom talk before, believe it or not. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me to give you this introduction to plant goals. Um, you can see uh, I'm Peter Shirley. I am a retired professional nature conservationist. Uh, I worked for half of my working life for the Wildlife Trusts in various capacities. Uh, I'm an amateur naturalist, amateur entomologist, in fact, and my particular interest is gore causing insects. So this afternoon, we I'm going to give you a, a very quick rundown of uh, what goals are, where you will find them on plants, um, some examples, quite a lot of examples of gall. Galls are uh, caused by various causes, and we'll go through some of the causes. Uh, and then at the end, uh, a few things about the relationship between human activities and galls, and there are more than you might think. So, uh, first of all, uh, what is a gall? So you can see the, uh, at least I hope you can all see the definition of a gall here with the increase in the size or number of cells of the host plant. Now, like almost everything else in nature, uh, a gall or not a gall is on a continuum of impact upon plant hosts. And even amongst gall experts, there is no absolutely 100% accepted definition of a gall. Some people think some things are galls that others think aren't galls. But for the purposes of this talk, uh, and in fact, the definition we use in the British Plant Gall Society is that there has to be an increase in the number of cells, uh, the size of cells, or both. And that manifests itself in various ways. So this is a gall. Uh, this is caused by a sawfly, a hymenopteran, on creeping willow. Uh, and it's uh, you're going to have a lot of... Uh, scientific names this afternoon. I don't expect you to remember them, uh, but you might remember some of the uh, genera because uh, this is the uh, caused by something called Eura collectiana. Um, and there's quite a lot of galls on willows that are caused by sawflies in the genus Eura. They so can say most galls are caused by mites and insects, but a variety of other things cause galls as well. In fact, mistletoe is a gall causer. It's one of the plants that causes galls because where it is rooted in inverted commas in the tissue of its host tree, uh, it does cause uh, swelling and an increase in the number of, swell, uh, of cells uh, in what is called the hosterium, I think. And uh, here's a some examples. Uh, this is uh, on oak. Uh, a gall which has got the common name of the hop gall or the artichoke gall and I think you can see why. Um, now I was talking to Nicola yesterday and I know that you use iRecord for your records uh, and you can record galls on iRecord and we do have verifiers in the system um, and uh, there is a, a trend in natural history these days to find vernacular names for almost everything. So uh, I'm always impressed by the ones they've come up with for mosses uh, in particular and, and one or two other things like that. So some galls have got already got familiar names or vernacular names. Um, and on our uh, social media sites, people keep coming up with names for galls that I've never seen, but this one is, is generally known as the, uh, as the artichoke or hop gall. It's in the genus Andricus, which is a huge genus of cynipid wasps, all of which either cause or live in galls on oak trees. Uh, this is another one that uh, is in a, a genus that causes lots and lots of galls on lots and lots of hosts. It's Contarinia tiliarum, and it's in the petioles of lime trees. And you can see the red swelling there. Um, and inside that is the, uh, the larva of the gall midge. Uh, gall midges are in the family Secidomyidae, uh, 
and that is the largest insect uh, the, was rather the insect family with the most number of gall causes in it uh, gall midges there are lots and lots of them all over the world this is um, a psyllid uh, aphids and scale insects can be gall causes uh, and this is on uh, rush and it's called Livorum juncorum, and it's quite a beautiful, as some of them are, uh, quite a beautiful thing when you find it. And uh, in the mites, then uh, this is uh, on um, birch, um, and its name just escapes me for the moment, but you will see more mite galls like, uh, like this one. But that's on a, a, a silver birch leaf. And something that is uh, uh, not common, but quite a few cinepid galls are actually double galls. This is uh, one of those artichoke galls that I showed you in the first photographs. Um, and the creature that causes the gall, the larva that's eating the tissue inside the gall, is actually ensconced in an inner gall. And you can see there the inner gall being uh, ejected from the outer gall and there's quite a few cinepid gall wasps that have this phenomenon and uh, so that inner gall will fall from the tree the larva inside will pupate and the adult will emerge uh, at a future date so uh, so we do get galls within galls and these are the main all causes. I've mentioned the mites already, especially the uh, superfamily area Foidea, and they tend to cause patches of hairs and hairy galls. And then insects, you can see there the main groups of insects. Uh, thrips is in brackets because we don't have any thrip gall causes in Britain, but in uh, tropical countries, tropical parts of the world. There are quite a lot of galls caused by thrips. And here's uh, uh, an example of a rather obscure gall. It's a, a Semudobia gall, it's a gall midge. And there are actually three species of Semudobia midges that cause these galls on the fruits of birch trees. So if you take um, the, uh, what were the acorns that when they become the seeds, uh, of birch trees hanging on the tree and you open them up pull them apart on a on a piece of white paper uh, works particularly well you will you will most likely find some of these little tiny oval galls inside which of course uh, is the larva of a gall midge although not inside this one because as you can see there is an exit hole so the culprit has escaped successfully one hopes Galls are found on most sorts of plants, including seaweeds, as it happens, although I know nothing about galls on seaweeds, uh, found on a few fungi. And in this part of the world, and indeed in North America, and the Palearctic in general, there is a pronounced uh, abundance and variety of galls on those three families. Uh, the beech family, which of course includes oaks, which bear a lot of galls, the daisy family and the rose family. And there is an idea of the numbers in Britain. So more than 100 on the daisy family, 90 on willows, <clears throat> and uh, more than 90 on the beeches and oaks and their relatives and so on. So they're very numerous and, and a great deal of variety on them as indeed is the case in other parts of the world. This is an aphid gall uh, in the petiole of a uh, poplar um, called Pemphigus spirothecae. Spirothecae, obviously, because it causes this uh, spiral distortion uh, of the, the petioles. And if you open that, you will find a colony of uh, aphids inside. The most... Uh, the most fruitful place to look for galls when you're out in the field is uh, woodland edge, 
where there's a variety of shrubs and trees and plenty of light, uh, you do get galls forming on trees deeper into woods, but um, never in quite so much abundance or variety as around the edge. And the whole ecotone, uh, if you have a, a woodland which grades into, sh into um, scrub and then grades into grassland, for instance, then uh, that's a very good place to be searching for galls. Um, you sometimes need to get down on your hands and knees to find them though on the herbaceous plants. There, there is a, a bias in gall recording to those that are on trees and shrubs between about three feet and six feet from the ground <laughs> because they're definitely the easiest to spot and the easiest to find when you are uh, when you're going about. Uh, galls uh, have a very long history. Um, there are some fossil galls, the oldest known is from a mere 302 million years ago. So this is not a new phenomenon at all. It's thought to have been caused by a sawfly, like that first bright red one that I showed you. Um, and there's also a fossil of some uh, aerial root galls on a tree fern from about 290 million years ago. The, uh, the main sort of insect causes, gall wasps and gall midges, they evolved with the flowering plants in the Cretaceous, which is from 140 to 70 million years ago. And then there are some really late comers. So the picture wing flies, the tephritids, which cause galls in particular on thistles and their allies. Um, they, uh, they only appeared about 34 million years ago, so they've barely started yet. The galls need to be closely associate uh, closely adapted to their host plants so most gall causes only cause galls on individual species or groups of genera or families of their host plants uh, there are some more polyphagous galls but they tend to be very simple and in fact one of the most polyphagous galls of all is the mistletoe which i mentioned earlier which has been recorded worldwide different mistletoes on more than 450 hosts and I think that's the record it is so far as I'm aware so where do we find them well well half of all galls are found on the leaves of plants and these are the figures for the rest So you can see that uh, it, by far the most are on leaves and stems, 85%. Uh, and you'd think hmm, buds, flowers, fruits, roots wouldn't leave room for very many. But in fact, you will find plenty in this country on all those parts of plants. They can be uh, swellings, nodules, uh, patches of hairs. Rolls. This is where the difficulty comes in defining a gall. For instance, quite a lot of insects will cause uh, the edges of leaves to roll up. And then there's a debate then about whether there is also an increase in the size of cells within those rolls. Uh, some of them are galls and some of them aren't. Folds, dimples, blisters, pustules, discs, balls, general enlargements of plant parts. Uh, you name it, and there's probably a gall that's like it. Um, amongst the most important galls in nature, but the least seen, are the nitrogen-fixing uh, bacterial galls on the roots of the pea family, the Fabaceae. So uh, any of you that grow peas and beans and so on or know a little bit about agriculture will know that you plant members of the Fabaceae family to enrich the soil because they put nitrogen back into the soil. Well, it's actually gall causing bacterium that uh, do the enriching rather than the plant itself. And they are, galls are thought of as sort of nature's genetic engineers because they hijack the plant's growth systems and hormones. Uh, to turn parts of the plants into living quarters and shelter for themselves. Uh, and in a way that is um, stable over time for particular species. So they always cause the same sort of gall and the same sort of growth. 
Um, and there's some curious things happen. So some of the cinnipid wasps that cause galls on oak trees, for instance, um, their galls at some stages of their lifespan are covered in a sticky secretion, rather like nectar, which is often attractive to ants uh, and other insects that uh, eat nectar. Uh, but of course, oak trees are wind pollinated. Their flowers don't produce any nectar but the tree will produce a nectar-like substance under the influence of a gall causer. Uh, and it's one of the mysteries really of the relationship between gall causers and their hosts as to how and why that sort of thing happens. Um, and here's not an example of that, uh, but this is something which you may have seen but not noticed uh, in the heads of poppies. So at the top is an ungalled seed head of poppy and at the bottom is a galled seed head, which if you cut it open, you can just see here three cells within which the larva of the cinnipid wasp uh, would develop. Um, and it causes that uh, very noticeable swelling of the poppy seed head. Uh, and that's one of those things that you sort of don't notice until someone's pointed it out to you. And then you'll start to notice it all over the place. Um, some gall species, gall causing species, like a lot of insects, have complicated life cycles. And one of the best known galls, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, is the oak apple gall, which is uh, pinky brown, about the size of a golf ball, sometimes a bit bigger, which appears in the spring on English oaks and um, uh, sessile oaks. And this is its life cycle. So we'll start, well, there's the host tree and there's a, a wingless agamic female. So we'll start with a wingless agamic female. Uh, in this winter, late winter, uh, these females emerge from root galls uh, and they climb the tree. It's a long way up an oak tree for a tiny insect. They're only about three millimeters long. Um, and they go right out to the tips of the branches and they lay their eggs in the developing buds. Uh, and these are agamic females. In other words, they can lay eggs, viable eggs, um, without needing to mate. And they do that. Uh, the, uh, uh, the eggs hatch and the larvae begin to feed and they form the, uh, the oak apple gall, within which here in the summer are male and female gall wasps. So this is the sexual generation. Uh, they mate and then the females go down underground and they lay their eggs on the roots of the oak tree uh, and they form galls on the roots of the oak tree. And they stay in those galls for two winters. So on any one oak tree, if you see oak apples there every year, uh, there will be two discrete populations of this gall wasp, which is called Biorhiza pallida, uh, on the tree, which is one reason why you sometimes get alternating years of a heavy crop of galls and a very light crop of galls, because there are two different populations uh, in there. Uh, so there's a typical uh, spring oak apple gall, not got the usual pink tinge, but that's uh, that's what they look like. And the root galls look like that. And there's a root, root galls with a few um, holes in. Uh, and from those oak apples in particular, the spring ones, uh, as many as 300 insects can emerge. Uh, they're uh, mostly cinnipeds. Uh, the gall causes offspring. Uh, there are other cinnipeds called inquilines, which I'll talk about uh, in a couple of slides time, but there are also parasitoids as well, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides time. Um, and the oak apples figure in um, uh, sort of folk myths and folk customs in this country uh, because Charles I, when he was still a prince, hid in an oak tree to escape the parliamentarians. Um, then uh, supporters of the Stuarts after the restoration of the monarchy uh, used to wear a sprig of oak with an oak apple attached 
uh, on Oak Apple Day, which is May the 29th, is Oak Apple Day, also known as Royal Oak Day. I presume that was round about the date that he was hiding in the oak tree, uh, but I'm not quite sure about that. And until 1859, Royal Oak Day was a public holiday in this country, but it isn't anymore. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I've, I've got the reason. It's the 29th of May. It's the birthday of Charles II uh, and the date of his restoration to the throne. So, um, so that's an old custom. And related to that is a tradition called Shikshak Day, where um, the local lads in the village uh, would go around with a bunch of nettles. And if you weren't wearing an oak apple, they would beat you with the nettles. So be warned, you might be beaten with nettles if you're not wearing a gall in your lapel on the 29th of May. <laughs> I don't think it happens anymore, really. So let's have a quick look at uh, one or two oak galls for you. Uh, this is a fairly new arrival in this country called um, Plagiotrochus creatius, um, which is on home oak uh, or uh, evergreen oak. Uh, we have very few oaks in this country. They're at the limit uh, of their northwestern range in the world, really. We've got uh, the two native species, uh, Quercus roba and Quercus petraea, and a whole lot of introduced species uh, amongst the most successful being the home oak uh, and the turkey oak, which we will uh, mention again uh, a bit later on. And then there's lots of ornamental oaks planted, red oaks, scarlet oaks. Uh, cork oaks and uh, various hybrids between them, uh, all of which have their own sort of complement of galls. These are called pea galls for obvious reasons on the underside of oak leaves. There's two or three species of those in the genus um, Cynips. Uh, this, unsurprisingly, has a common name as well. It's called the cotton wall gall and it's on ac um, catkins uh, of oaks. Uh, not particularly common and often high up in the trees, so uh, a considerably under-recorded. Um, I think you've probably all seen spangle galls. There are four or five different species of those. There's two here. Uh, the silk button galls, which are the little round ones with a hollow centre, golden coloured and the more reddish or rusty coloured uh, common spangle gall, Neurotorus quercus baccarum. And uh, sometimes people call these oak apples, but they're more properly called the cherry gall because they do look a bit like cherries. Uh, and it's another Cynips species, Cynips Quercus folii. And something which you may all well be familiar with now uh, on acorns is the nupper gall, uh, which is this mass of tissue which takes over the acorn. And sometimes every acorn on a tree in some years can be affected. And this only arrived in this country about 60 years ago, uh, and it's uh, become very common. It's another one of the galls with an inner gall. The, the gall causer sits, uh, there's a hollow chamber inside that massive tissue, and at the bottom of the hollow chamber is the, um, is the gall that the creature itself is, uh, is actually in. Um, and just a, a word here that uh, there are some Chalcid wasp gall causes as well, but not as many as um, cinnipid wasps. Um, and they are, uh, both of those families are in the parasitica of the Hymenoptera. Um, and they're unusual within uh, that group of Hymenopterans in that they are plant eaters rather than parasites on uh, other invertebrates. Um, some of those parasites to have a good go at the gall causes themselves, but they've got a different lifestyle to all the rest of their group. Um, this is another pemphigus gall on um, uh, poplars uh, and willows, uh, and it also has quite a complex life cycle, as a lot of uh, aphids do. So just very quickly starts off on members of the, uh, the daisy family, but doesn't cause galls on them. Uh, and winged aphids fly to poplar trees, lay their eggs, uh, the larvae emerge, the galls develop. Uh, and then, uh, as with other aphids, there are several generations of 
uh, wingless uh, aphids uh, through the summer uh, before the winged generation mates and flies off and lays eggs again on the Asteraceae. So another complex uh, life cycle, and there's quite a lot of them. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to go all the way through this slide. This is just to demonstrate um, a food web. Um, now, within galls, uh, as well as the gall causes, there will be other cynipids uh, who are, in effect, lodgers. Um, they uh, lay their eggs in the gall tissue and they're developing the gall tissue. Um, but they're not the gall causes, but they are closely related to them. Sometimes the way they uh, lay their eggs and where they are in the gall causes the death of the gall causer. Sometimes it doesn't, uh, and they just live side by side in the gall and all emerge in their own time. Um, but those uh, inquilines and gall causes themselves uh, are the host of various parasitoid wasps. Uh, and some of the parasitoid wasps are indeed hosts for hyperparasitoid wasps. Uh, and so this is a food web indicating those relationships. The thicker the line, um, the more frequently the relationship has been observed. Uh, and the, uh, the, the thing that's being fed on is at the opposite end of the arrowhead and the thing that's feeding is at the arrowhead. Uh, and so, this is a whole lot of things, and, and all of these are in this gall, which is uh, the uh, Andricus colari. It's introduced to this country in the 19th century uh, for the tannin. Galls on oak trees concentrate tannin, and that's a, a valuable substance uh, within the dyeing trade and the printing trade. We'll come back briefly to that later on as well. Um, so uh, these are very common. You find these particularly on um, oak saplings, uh, sometimes in great numbers. So uh, and similar relationships here. Uh, top left there, you have very prominent gall, which you may well be familiar with, the Bedegua gall on, <clears throat> on rose trees, sometimes now apparently called the the green felt gall, I think, or something like that, on some of the recording schemes. Um, and they're rather like the oak apple, there can be dozens and dozens of wasps uh, within this gall. Uh, and again, a whole suite or guild of parasitoids and hyperparasitoids. But the one thing that's different um, about this one is there is actually an ichneumon wasp which parasitizes the gall causa in this. It's the only one in this country that we know of that um, does so. Um, it's called Orthopelma mediator, which I always think is a lovely name. Uh, that's the section through um, the gall on rows. Uh, and uh, only about 1% of the uh, gall causes are males, as it happens, it's almost entirely a, a female species, but not quite. Um, the uh, inhabitants overwinter, uh, so you find the galls about this time of the year, you find them all through the year, and then they emerge in the spring. They're sometimes called Robin's pin cushion galls. Um, and birds like to peck these open, as they do indeed oak apples, you often find them opened uh, so that the inhabitants can be eaten by the birds and here uh, that is the gall causa that is a cinepid wasp uh, diplolepis rosae is its name that's the ichneumon wasp also palma mediator and that's a typical chalcid wasp uh, they tend to have bright metallic colors uh, clubbed antenna and some of the species have lung ovipositors as their uh, we've mentioned willows and poplars, a uh, number of galls you will find on there, particularly sawfly galls, but uh, there are plenty of others as well. So this is another Eura gall, uh, the red bean gall, uh, Eura proxima, which is very common uh, and uh, you'll find it probably on almost every crack willow that you look at uh, along the along the 
River Trent. I'm sure there's plenty of willows in the Trent Valley. Um, well, I live, by the way, just as an aside, uh, very close to one of the tributaries of the Trent. I live very close to the Tame, which, of course, rises and flows through the Black Country and makes its way around various Black Country towns. And I, I'm in West Bromwich. Um, and uh, you may not know this about it, though. It's the only main river, because it is classed as a main river, the Tame, the only main river that rises in what is now an industrial area. So it rises in one of the hills of the Black Country because uh, we're, we're on the watershed uh, in the Black Country. So to the west, everything flows off to the Severn and the Bristol Channel and to the east, everything flows off to the Trent. So you get all of our water in the end. Uh, it's a lot cleaner now than it used to be, but not as clean as you'd like it, I guess. <laughs> um, this is another sort of gall, uh, which is a sort of a fasciation uh, where the uh, the nodes between leaves are are brought together um, and it's rather an attractive thing actually caused by a gall midge Rabdafaga cineriarum um, and then we have the, uh, another eura gall that's on goat willow um, another gall midge so this is sort of a, a lumpy rather indeterminately shaped gall as you can see um, and just for the change, here's an opened gall uh, caused by a moth, Sidia uh, servilana. And there indeed is the larva of the moth inside the gall, and that's also on willow trees. Mentioned mite galls. Um, uh, it's difficult often to record mite galls accurately because there's a lot of confusion with their taxonomy. It's constantly under revision. And to be honest, the reason is there aren't enough professional entomologists and taxonomists to tackle the issues and the problems. Uh, some of you are probably aware that we're, we're very short of professional taxonomists now. Um, very, very few people go into that or are able to go into that. The opportunities aren't there. Um, but there are some that you can record and you will find information about. So here's a couple. Top left on field maple, uh, little red pustules. Uh, there's several other species that cause little red pustules as well. But little red pustules on field maple uh, are Assyria galls, Assyria myriadium. Uh, the brown discoloration and distortion of the ash keys is another extremely common gall which you'll spot easily in the winter and it's one of the galls you can record if you're on a train passing a tree because it's so obvious what it is um, and that's Assyria um, fraxinophora um, did I say maples it's did I say maple or ash then it's on the keys of ash it's Assyria fraxinophora and then you might have this in your garden. If you have a spindle tree in your garden, that curling over of the edge of the leaf is a, an areophyid, areophyes convolvans on spindle. Uh, this is a typical sort of uh, uh, irinian, irineal gall, so a hairy gall. And again, if you've got a walnut tree, you've probably got this on it. I've got a little walnut tree uh, and uh, it has this gall on it in my garden, Assyria erineus. Uh, but something a bit more spectacular, which is unmistakable on the odd occasion you come across it, is this uh, Assyria echii on bugloss. So it makes the whole plant come out in this uh, bushy form. Then, not really mentioned them yet, there are galls caused by fungi. Um, and uh, some of them are quite important because they can be um, pests of crops and so on, as indeed can insect causing galls. So here's one again, which you may have seen and wondered what it is. These are called pocket plums. And it occurs on prunus uh, and it affects the fruit. And again, 
I've got this, well, say in my garden, overhanging my garden from my next door neighbour's plum tree. Although this year I've got a lovely crop of plum, plums as it happens. But they infest the plums, and it's Tafrina pruni. Uh, and you see how they distort the plums. They never develop into fruit. You can get a very obvious gall. Uh, here's one that's not quite so obvious on this photograph, but in the spring, if you go anywhere where there are stands of Alexanders, then you will find loads and loads of this gall, which is <clears throat> Pachinia smyrnii uh, on Alexanders, uh, and lots of blotches on the leaves and, uh, and so on. Uh, and that's also uh, very obvious and very striking when you see it. And there we have a little uh, Gymnosporangium. Uh, this is another genus that affects um, fruit. Uh, so there's a Gymnosporangium sabina is on pear trees. Uh, this is Gymnosporangium confusum, which is on medlars, mespilus, on medlar trees. And what have I got here? Oh, yes. This used to be quite a rare gall, but now it seems to be increasingly common. Um, it's um, Tafrina alni on alder cones. Uh, it was it was still quite uncommon as recently as 30 years ago, uh, but now it uh, it seems to be in many, many places. Uh, why it's suddenly taken off in that way, nobody's quite sure. Uh, and here's one that is very important. This, as you can see, uh, is uh, wheat and the little black things that you can see sticking out are ergot, claviceps purpurea. Um, it's a smut gall. It affects a quite a lot of cereals um, and it is a poison. So in humans, it causes a reaction, uh, which is a sort of a, a fit, for want of a better word, uh, called St Anthony's fire. So if you eat bread that's been baked with this inside it, you might suffer from St Anthony's fire. Um, and it is still a problem in inverted commas. Uh, uh, farmers have to be aware of it and deal with it when they find it in their crops, um, because if it gets into hay and silage, then uh, it's not good for the livestock that eats that hay and silage at all. So, uh, so there's a few fungal galls. Uh, we've mentioned gall midges. Uh, it's not only midges that cause galls in the fly order, in the diptera. Uh, this is uh, called a mophead gall, uh, and it's caused by an anthemyid fly on male ferns. It's Chirosia betuliti, which makes it sound as if it ought to be on birch trees, but it's not. It's on ferns, on male ferns. Uh, I mentioned picture wing flies earlier to fitted flies. So these uh, very prominent galls on the stems of thistles are caused by those. Now, you may well find these along your area of uh, sort of the, the uh, Northeast Midlands, um, but it, it has always been considered a, a Southern species in this country, but it, it does seem to be spreading North. Um, and if any of you have been to North America, you might be familiar with the bull galls on goldenrod, uh, which are very common in Canada and North America and, uh, and America, which are also caused by tefritid flies. Uh, so, uh, and there's a number of other galls, species cause other galls as well. Um, this is the head of a wild carrot uh, with the midge, midge gall caused by a midge with a very long name. Uh, Kieferia pericarpii cola. But uh, don't worry about remembering it. But when you see it somewhere, you'll be reminded, ah, yes, I know that. That's a gall midge. Uh, and also very common uh, all over the place are these lumps and bumps on uh, stinging nettles. Uh, sometimes cause distorted stems as well and with very heavy infestations. And this is Dazinura urtica. And Dazinura is another genus of gall midges that has an enormous number of uh, gall causing species in it, uh, closely related to the Contarinians that I mentioned earlier. Um, 
we're we, we're obsessed in nature conservation with native and non-native species and i've got a whole other lecture on that because i have some more unorthodox views on that <laughs> to the general ones um and it's uh, very curious because when you study a particular group of organisms like dragonflies for instance people tend to get very excited and think it's good when the number of species increases um so mm, this is all to do with our sort of values and our attitudes and so on uh, and also just as a quick aside as to how the natural world was when ecology was thought of and developed over the past 200 years so what we found when we realized what we were looking at is what we think should be there all the time uh, but that's a part um i'll get off my soapbox there's quite a lot of gauze that are recent arrivals uh by recent i mean within the last few decades um so here on turkey oak is something called anacris crossularii on the catkins of turkey oak uh looks very similar to those root galls of the oak apple if you remember from uh, earlier on uh here's one uh sort of these uh, very prominent red galls again on turkey oak uh, it's not been here very long but it's been here long enough to have its name changed when it arrived it was neuroterus saliens now it's pseudo neuroterus saliens on turkey oak uh, then we have uh got a better photograph of this one coming up but can you see these sort of strap light projections coming off here this is something called Andricus Aries, uh, which arrived about 35 years ago. I once travelled a 140 mile round trip to see some specimens of this in the wild. But the person on the Wirral, if you're still with us, it was up on the Wirral, I think, where I saw it all close to the Wirral. Um, since when it's uh, turned up in my garden. <laughs> so I could have saved a lot of petrol it was someone gave me a little oak sapling and it turned up on the little oak sapling and because there is, <clears throat> excuse me the ramshorn gall uh, and a very pretty little gall this one uh, which uh, appears on the bowls of trees uh, on the the latent buds in the bark and so on called andricus jimmyus that arrived in 2008 um and it's oh, what happened there? What's next? Oh, right, there, there's a better example of Andricus Aries. Uh, you can see the very long strap light projections of it. It's very uh, prominent, once seen, never forgotten. And the gall itself is at the bottom here where the creature is. Um, and this is a, a good opportunity to mention why we had these new arrivals. Uh, what's going on? Well, another complication with the galls is alternation of hosts. We've seen it already this afternoon with those aphids uh, on uh, different, uh, different hosts in their annual life cycle. But cinepid wasps, some of them have, uh, well, a lot of them have the uh, agamic and sexual generations that we talked about with Bioriza pallida. Um, and, and sometimes those two generations are on different oak trees sometimes even on oak trees in different groups, because genus Quercus is a very big genus with three or four subgenera uh, within it. Um, so uh, a number of the new arrivals, uh, one generation is on our native oaks and the other generation is on turkey oaks. So the marble gall, which I showed you earlier, Andricus calari, um, that is a, another species that has the two generations on different hosts. Turkey oaks were introduced to this country in the uh, probably the late 17th century, certainly the 18th century, uh, and they've been widely planted and they've also generated themselves. So as the population of turkey oaks has grown, so the number of oak ghoul wasp species in this country has increased in number uh, because they're able to complete their life cycles. So any that's arrived before uh, they would die out after just uh, half a generation uh, or one generation because they couldn't complete their life cycle with the second generation. Uh, there was when the uh, marble galls were introduced for the dyeing trade in the 19th century, there was a lot of discussion about whether they would cause the death of oak trees 
as there was with the Nupagal when it increased in numbers in the 70s and 80s, um, completely overlooking the fact that, A, lots and lots of things eat acorns, uh, and B, in its lifetime, a mature oak tree produces tens of thousands of oak acorns, and to keep the population stable, it only has to leave one viable descendant, if you think about it. So there's not much chance of things eating the acorns causing the, causing the oak trees to die out. Um, and the final reason why it's irrelevant, really, is because forest trees like oaks are entirely dependent on people as to how many grow and where they grow. We either plant them, uproot them, or allow them to grow where they've regenerated themselves. It's entirely down to us how many oak trees there are in this country, uh, not the insects that are uh, happily feeding on them. And, uh, oh, this is, a, this is an interesting one. This is another one of the traded galls, which I'll talk about in a few minutes more. This is Andricus infectorius. We've started recording this in very recently, actually. Uh, only in the past maybe three or four years. Um, but the feeling is that it's not a new arrival. Uh, although this one looks a bit different because it's got these, a lot of these warty bumps on, which is characteristic of it. Uh, a number of them are much smoother and rounder and look just like the marble galls. Uh, and so we think that they've just been unnoticed and unrecorded. And there are one or two differences between them and marble galls, which you can look for. The, these tend to have a tapered base, for instance, which you can't quite see from this photograph. And because we've been talking about the gall causes, but only looking at their galls, here is a typical cinepid wasp. So it's brown, it's about three millimeters long. Um, it's more than half abdomen, as you can see. Uh, and has a very hunched look with a, a tiny head, tiny head there on the front of this sort of uh, hunched abdomen and much reduced wing venation compared to uh, other uh, insects in the Hymenoptera. So, uh, so that's what a, uh, an Andricus gall wasp looks like. Uh, a new arrival that's caused a bit more concern is this one, Dryocosmus, um, which came with a name, the Oriental Chestnut Gall Wasp. Uh, and this, uh, in parts of the world, um, Europe, parts of Europe in particular, is an agricultural pest because it uh, affects um, sweet chestnut trees and it affects the crop. Uh, and so it's a notifiable insect. The Forestry Commission wants to know if you find it or see it anywhere. So here's, a, here's the galls, uh, one there in the leaves. These are two are leaf galls, but the leaves have gone completely. The, the, the gall has taken them over. And that's what the wasp looks like. In this case, it's a black wasp rather than a brown wasp. But again, it's got that sort of hunched appearance and relatively small head and large abdomen. So if you find that, uh, you need to tell somebody. Uh, now, uh, I'm moving on now to the relationship between people and ghouls, but are there any questions or comments before I do so? Or do we want a five minute break, Nicola? Or shall we carry on? Uh, there's not much in the chat in terms of questions. Um, John, I think this is in reference to the bramble ghouls that you talked about. I won't attempt to remember the Latin, um, saying that they're, they're in Trentum, that you've seen them in Trentum. And I think certainly on a walk with our volunteers, we saw them on, not on Bramble, on Thistle, sorry. Um, um, yeah, right, okay. Yeah. We saw them at, at Branston Lees just outside Burton the other day. Right, okay. So, yeah, they certainly are in the area. Uh, but does anyone have any questions at this midway point? Oh, I'm slightly over midway. Now feel free to pop it in the chat or come off mute if you do. Okay, okay. So, so we've better look at uh, gall causes and where they are, what they are, so on and so forth. And um, 
as members of my family have sometimes said to me, but why bother? <laughs> what's, what's important about them? Well, there's quite a lot that's important about them. Uh, for a start, they, they have these, as I mentioned, this mysterious way of acting as genetic engineers, and that's scientifically quite interesting uh, and, and can lead to interesting lines of research. And uh, maybe they're better at doing that than we are, for instance. Uh, but also, they've they've always been quite important from the point of view of um, trade and food. So these are Andricus infectorius Gauls, and uh, with their uh, their trading name is the Aleppo Gaul, um, because they were originally imported uh, around Europe from uh, the Middle East. So they're called the Aleppo Gaul, um, and. They've been traded for centuries. Uh, I mentioned Charles II earlier. Well, his dad, Charles I, he gave the um, uh, permission, um, a charter to what became the East India Company. So that's way back in the first part of the first quarter, probably of the 17th century. Um, and in the charter, he granted them permission to import, and this is the list of, uh, of the stuff, uh, some of the stuff they could import. They could import white pepper, rich carpets of Camabi, wherever that is, oh, Camabi in Persia, mirabilians, and I've never found out what a mirabilian is, but it sounds good, musk, silver, wormwood, galls, sugar, and candy. So as long ago as the middle of the 17th century, we were importing galls for the dyeing and, uh, and printing trade, but particularly the dyeing trade. So uh, I'll come back to the, the printing trade in a moment. Now, this is a fungal gall, um, a corn smut, uh, and it's on maize and it's in Central America, Central and South America. This is the ambro called the ambrosia of the Aztecs. So it was considered to be a great delicacy uh, and very sweet to eat, as is this one, which you will find in this country. Um, it's called the Lighthouse Gaul, uh, Rondaniola Berseria, and it's on ground ivy. Um, and it is eaten as a sweet delicacy uh, in France and Sweden. I don't know why France and Sweden nowhere in between, uh, but apparently that's edible. Now, having said that, I've never tried to eat it. Um, and I'm not advising you to try and eat it. I'm just saying that some people do eat it. So, uh, so that's, uh, 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 that's an interesting one. Uh, and in other parts of the world as well, um, it, Gauls form local food. This is called a bloodwood apple um, and it's found on uh, a species of eucalyptus tree in Australia um, and it is uh, as uh, I've never watched it but as I understand uh, get me out of here I'm a celebrity they're always eating bush tucker well this is Australian bush tucker you can eat it um, and th that gall cause of the larva there it's the larva of a scale insect um, and uh, so uh, it's also got the name, the whole thing got the name of the bush coconut because it does look vaguely like a coconut, but there's no scale there. So I'm not quite sure uh, how it relates in size to a coconut. So uh, I mentioned printing a few times. Um, when we were self-sufficient, like seven, 800 years ago, country estates growing all of their own food, having all of their own livestock and so on and so forth. Um, they would also make their own ink with various ingredients. And amongst the ingredients would be uh, ground up galls. Uh, and it, it makes very good, very permanent ink. Um, so there's two things about that. Uh, the one is that uh, you can authenticate uh, documents uh, which may purport, for instance, to come from come from a country estate in Nottinghamshire uh, in the 16th century or whatever. Uh, if you know what the 
ingredients were for the ink they made to write their documents, then you can authenticate a document which claims to be one of those by analyzing the ink on the paper. The other thing is that in many countries, including this country and Germany, uh, a material from Gauls was used in the ink used for banknotes. Uh, it isn't any longer, but up until the 1970s, so up until 50 years ago, um, German legal documents had to be written in Gaul ink because it was permanent, wouldn't fade, and it would remain there in perpetuity, in effect, uh, in the legal document. They've also been used, uh, uh, Gaul inks and colorings have been used in hair dye, uh, turkey red coloring, which some of you might be familiar with, um, and indeed, some of you may have some on you if you have any tattoos, because they're also one of the constituents of tattoo ink. So you may be, you may have some gall ink on your skin. Uh, so that's an important aspect of them. And there's an example of an old document, which I should have put up before, but forgot to press the button. Um, this is one of the most famous and one of the most economically important Gaul causes of all time. Um, it used to be called Phyloxera Vastatrix, and it's an aphid that infects grapevines. It's changed its name now. It's now Dactulus Thyra, um, but it still causes galls on, on grapevines, whatever you call it. Um, and it's a North American species originally. When Europeans colonized North America, they found uh, grapevines growing there and they brought them back to Europe um, because they thought they would uh, provide good root, root stock for some reason for European vines, but they brought the aphid back with them. Uh, and the two generations of this aphid stay on the vine, but like the oak apple gall wasp, in the summer they're on the leaves and in the winter they're on the roots and they devastate the crop. Um, and nobody could find out how to control them because they didn't know about the generations being on the roots. So for instance, they would, uh, one thing tried to control them was the flooding of the vineyards in the winter, but they were able to survive that within their waterproof galls uh, in the roots. Um, and, there were never such a problem where they came from in North America because the winters were so much harder that many of them didn't survive the winters, but they were put into places in France in particular with milder winters. And so they were able to, uh, to survive. They arrived in Europe in the 1860s. And then there was a war with Prussia, France and Prussia, I think, uh, in 18, uh, around about that time. Um, and after the war in 1870, Bismarck, the German uh, politician, extracted five billion francs from France uh, in war reparations, apparently. And at that time, the aphid was costing the French wine industry twice as much. It had enormously bad impact on the, uh, on the wine trade. And it is still a major pest today and has to be controlled um, and, uh, and is still having effects today. And a bit of poetry for you. T.H. Uh, White in The Sword in the Stone, and this is about the longevity of documents written, written in ink. In The Sword in the Stone, he says, uh, I'm not very good at reading poetry, but here we go. My leaves come last and go the last. Um, he's talking about oak trees, I think. Uh, I am a conservative, I am, and out of my apples they make ink, whose words may live as long as me, even as long as me. So there's some galls in poetry. And coming to the end now, um, a few gall personalities, believe it or not. Anybody who's interested in cycling, by the way, the... Um, King of the Mountains jersey was worn for a few days this year by a man named Felix Gore, which I thought was very interesting. Um, but there are others. Uh, first person, really, or one of the first people to 
try to sort of uh, quantify goals, write about goals and study goals and so on, was this man who many of you will have heard of. His name is John Ray, the naturalist. Uh, he did a lot of early research on goals. Um, I'm about to be joined by my wife. She'll be looking over my shoulder in a minute. Um, sorry about the, the black writing on this. It, it's part of the photograph and I can't change it to get the contrast right to read it. Uh, but just as a name again, uh, one of the Indian chiefs, sorry, Native American uh, chiefs who uh, fought against General Custer was Chief Gaul. Uh, he was from a Canadian tribe. Uh, this is a friend of mine, a Canadian biologist named uh, Joe Shorthouse, uh, who's an emeritus professor at uh, Lawrence Town, I think it's Lawrence Town University in Canada. Um, and I don't know whether you can see the number plate of his car there. You can pick your own number plate in Canada. So you can see maybe that his number plate is is Gaul's one. <laughs> so he's very proud of that. Um, and then, uh, now this is an interesting guy. Um, this is um, Alfred Kinsey. Now, people of a certain vintage, like me, will remember Alfred Kinsey, who in the 1950s uh, conducted a study and published the results of a study on human sexuality and became uh, either famous or notorious, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, but uh, he did become very famous for those studies. But for the first half of his academic life, he studied gall wasps. Um, and he was a great authority on gall wasps, and he's still referenced in textbooks on gall wasps and so on. Um, and uh, it's just uh, interesting how everything goes around in circles, isn't it? So. I think he probably got the idea of uh, complicated sexuality from ghoul wasps because because they they have complicated sex lives. Uh, and then it came to the fore with his publications. And now pretty well all of social discourse in this country seems to be around gender and sexual characteristics. So uh, maybe he'll become famous again and his research will be unearthed. But there we are. He was a great expert on cinepid wasps. Uh, and this guy is not an expert on wasps, on gall wasps, I don't think. But obviously, there's a lot of gauls where he lives, uh, which is in Spain, because he's made a whole costume out of them, sort of the Spanish equivalent of the green man. Um, he's actually the character in Spain is called a jaramacho. It's a Spanish carnival character um who's a protector of children and cattle it's a strange combination isn't it protector of children and cattle and brings fertility and he's always dressed in natural materials mm. so there we are so so a few personalities uh, a few things about goals and why they might be important if you're motivated to find out more then you can find plenty online uh facebook twitter and Flickr in particular. I run the uh, the Twitter feed. We've got nearly, we've got 1,750 followers. Nearest makes no difference um, until Elon Musk finds a way of chasing them all off. But we've got 1,750 followers all over the world and every continent except Antarctica. So there is quite a community of uh, people interested in Gauls. It, it is, when you study Gauls, you are in fact bringing together entomology, mycology, botany, you bring it to, you know, it's a, a cross-discipline uh, interest for people, uh, for naturalists and so on. Um, uh, on Facebook, there's a couple of American sites as well. There's a huge number of gauls in California on the oaks there. Uh, I mentioned that oaks are at the limit of their uh, northern and western extent in the world here in this country which is why we've only got the two native species. There are scores of species of oaks. Uh, the epicenter for them, in fact, is Mexico uh, and that part of the world. There's more oaks there than uh, anywhere else. Uh, there's an excellent uh, site called Plant Parasites of Europe, which does more than galls. Uh, it does leaf miners and, and uh, other creatures as well. Uh, Blad miniaders. Uh, I, can, I never know how to say it, but you can see it there. And we do have our own 
British Blind Gall Society, uh, of which uh, I am a member and past chair. Um, Gall, you need to know, if you want to find out more, uh, Field Studies Council uh, have just published the third edition of their aid gap key to identifying plant goals, um, British plant goals, as you can see here. Full disclosure, if you should buy a copy of that book, I will get a few pence royalties, but I don't think it'd be enough to um, uh, go on a foreign holiday or anything with. But uh, but uh, it is, I, I can recommend it if I'm allowed to recommend something that I've helped to write. Uh, if you want to know more about Gauls and people and more about the ins and outs of, of their physiology and research into Gauls and so on, uh, the New Naturalist Plant Gauls by my co-author of the other book, Margaret Redfern, is the best book you could possibly have Maybe about that. Gauls. Um, and then on the right is uh, a little wild guides, photographic guide, which has got... Uh, I don't know, about a hundred of the commonest schools in Britain uh, illustrated and uh, annotated in there. Uh, in the plant goals keys, we've got about 1,500 or 1,600 goals done in the keys. So there's plenty, plenty to look for. There's plenty still to find out about goals in this co country. There's a, you know, a whole field that uh that you can get engaged in you can keep goals you can breed them out you can study the parasitoids there's all sorts of things so i think it's an interesting subject i actually haven't bored you all this afternoon with it uh but uh it's been great talking to you um i've uh, pinched lots of people's photographs as you can see here uh and uh there's that uh uh, Robin Spin Cushing Gall again, and thank you all for listening and allowing me to put all this in front of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. That was really interesting. I had no idea, uh, particularly about the last <laughs> part of it, just the importance of it, the importance of Gauls throughout history. That was that was really, yeah. Thank you so much for putting this on. Okay. Does anyone have any <laughs> um, questions about any of that? for for peter um oh yeah we got one from david is the gall growth a response to chemicals released by the larvae um uh, yes we think so um uh, we think it's uh in response to hormones uh we think that the uh because what happens is the uh, very few goals are formed when the eggs are laid uh there is a dragonfly might be more than one dragonfly gall causer um, where the gall, the plant tissue starts to swell as a result of oviposition, um, uh, but not so much with most galls. So the larva emerges from the egg and starts to feed, and then as it feeds, the gall forms. So we think that it's something that is released in the. Uh, do we, no, I've thought about this before. Do we insect larvae have saliva?